This is a 1996 Alpina B3 Touring, and it's one of the coolest sporty 90s wagons you can find. It's based on the BMW 3 Series wagon from the 90s, but with more power, more rare, and more cool. And today I'm going to review the B3 Touring and show you everything. Before I get started, big news, this Alpina B3 Touring is currently for sale, being auctioned live on Cars and Bids, which is my enthusiast car auction website. This B3 Touring is a tremendously special wagon with excellent service history, and it's incredibly rare, and it's already imported to the US and titled here, so you don't have to go through that hassle. So once you've finished watching this video, click the link in the description below to head over to the live auction for this Alpina B3 Touring on Cars and Bids, where you can bid on it and buy it only on Cars and Bids. So let's talk Alpina B3. The 1990s BMW 3 Series, the E36, wasn't sold here in North America as a station wagon, but it was offered with the wagon body style in other markets, and this is one of those cars. However, this is no typical 3 Series wagon. It's been modified by noted BMW tuner Alpina with a larger engine, more power, and a lot of other changes, which I'll show you. And this is definitely one of the coolest 1990s wagons. And today I'm going to review it. First, I'll take you on a thorough tour of the B3 Touring and show you all of its interesting quirks and features. Then I'll get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'll give it a Doug score. All right, I'm gonna start the quirks and features, the Alpina B3 Touring with the powertrain, where there is a lot to talk about because this is very different from a standard BMW engine. Now, to make this car, Alpina takes the standard three liter six cylinder from BMW and dramatically modifies it in a lot of ways. One big one is they change the engine size. They bore it out from three liters to 3.2 liters, so it's physically a larger engine. They also do a hand port and polish to this powertrain, meaning that the cylinder head is Alpina specific compared to what you get from BMW. And there are a lot of other upgrades too, including conrods, crank, and valves from the BMW M3. The result of these upgrades and more is around 265 horsepower in the Alpina B3 Touring and about 245 pound-feet of torque. Pretty big figures. In fact, those numbers are higher than what the US spec BMW M3 was offering in this era. This car has more power than the US M3. And next up on the subject of mechanical upgrades to the B3 Touring, another change compared to a standard 3 Series Touring from this era is suspension. Now, Pina upgrades the suspension to this car for the B3 Touring. Now, it's important to point out that Alpina doesn't go for the craziest, stiffest, high-performance sports suspension for the best handling performance. That's not really Alpina's thing. They're more about, like, general overall upgrades to create like an excellent balanced touring car. And so this B3 is lowered compared to a standard 3 Series for a better look, but the suspension isn't necessarily stiffer. It's intended to just be beefier, upgraded, better for cruising. It still handles well, the owner tells me, but it's sort of a touring car suspension upgrade rather than like all out stiffness and track performance. But anyway, next we move on to some other Alpina upgrades to this car over a regular BMW. And two of the biggest cosmetic changes you can see right now. One is the graphics on the side. These gold stripes that sort of go down the entire side of the car. They say Alpina, and they're very characteristic of Alpina modified cars in this time. It was an Alpina signature that people love to see, and this car has them, these Alpina stripe graphics. You can also see a similar Alpina signature up front. The front bumper is lower to the ground, as you can see, with Alpina written in large, kind of dramatic letters right in the center. This was characteristic of many Alpina cars from this time period. And I suspect the reason they did this is they didn't want to mess with the BMW grille and logo up front, but they still wanted to get the Alpina name in the front of the car somewhere. And so they thought, how can we possibly do that? And the answer was a lower front bumper and Alpina written in large script right in the center, which allows them to get their name directly on the front of the car. And then there's the wheels. For years, Alpina made cars with wheels that looked like this. In fact, 
They still do. Most of the modern Alpina models still have wheels that roughly share this design. So this wheel design is very characteristic, very distinctive to Alpina, and you can see the Alpina logo directly in the center. And you can also see, if you look closely, there's no valve stem cap anywhere. Around the edge of the wheel, you don't have a valve stem cap to add air to the tire, which is unusual. And that's because Alpina wheels have a hidden little trick to them. Here's how this works. You take this little hook that you can see, tiny little thing, and then you stick it into this piece which comes off the wheel center. You can pull it out with the hook and then that part is exposed and from there you can pull off the entire center cap with the Alpina logo on it. Pull that off and then you can see the valve stem cap is integrated into the center of the wheel, which is crazy. That's where you add air. You go into the wheel center and you'll find your valve stem cap there. I guess they do that because they don't want to uglify the wheel by putting the valve stem cap somewhere along the side like virtually all other car wheels have. Instead, they hide it in the center under the center cap with this little hook functioning basically as a key. Very unusual. And next, I'm moving around to the back of the B3 Touring. A couple of interesting upgrades back here. One is the exhaust tips. You take a look at them, they don't look all that unusual, but they are sort of oval in shape, as you can see, not circles. BMW exhaust tips from this era were all circular, but Alpina exhaust tips were all more oval, and that was one of the distinguishing things between BMW and Alpina. Alpina changed the shape of the exhaust tip as a differentiator from BMW. Now also around back you can see the badging on the back, BMW in the center as that's what this car is, but Alpina over on the side, very large to make it clear, and over on the other side, B3 3.2 to let people know precisely which Alpina this car is. And next up, another interesting thing on the outside of this car is the color. It's called Alpina Blue Metallic, and it's kind of Alpina's color. They've used it for many, many years. They still do, and it's included in a lot of their press photos and advertisements, and it's kind of Alpina's most famous color, Alpina Blue Metallic. But the interesting thing is it's painted by BMW because Alpina gets the car from BMW after it's already completed production, and so BMW does the painting. So even though this is an Alpina color, it's painted on the car by BMW. And Alpina has a licensing agreement with BMW that BMW will paint Alpina cars in Alpina Blue Metallic, but they won't use that color for for anybody else. No matter how much you ask or beg or pay them, it's only for Alpina cars like this one. But the result of that is that BMW treats it as a BMW individual color like other special colors. And so you can see the label under the hood calling this a special BMW individual painted car, even though it's technically the Alpina blue color. Now, also under the hood in terms of labels, some interesting things under here. If you look at the very base of the windshield, you can see the original VIN for this car, but you can also see, if you look closely, that it's been crossed out kind of faintly. It's just got a line through it like it doesn't count anymore, and that's because it technically doesn't. When Alpina gets the car, they modify it, upgrade it, and then add their own VIN, which you can see is stamped here, a completely different VIN than the one BMW put on from the factory, and that is the Alpina VIN, and now this car's true VIN once it's finished with its Alpina modifications. And you can see another plaque located here, kind of on the side of the engine bay, which is the Alpina manufacturer's plaque, which once again includes the new Alpina VIN, since the BMW one was crossed out. Kind of interesting. But anyway, next up we move on to the interior of the B3 Touring, where you'll find quite a few more changes compared to a standard BMW. Open up the door and you can see on the door sill, Alpina, which gives you an idea of what you're about to climb into. But unquestionably the largest changes in here come to the transmission and to the steering wheel, and they are linked. So allow me to talk about them. The transmission, you can see this car has an automatic. That sort of fits in with the Alpina ethos that I mentioned earlier, sort of touring cars modified for speed and luxury rather than all out track performance. And in fact, the owner of this car told me there are only 89 of these B3 Tourings ever made for the entire world, just 89. And the majority of them were ordered with an automatic transmission because it was really sort of the Alpina 
away. But Alpina didn't want to just give you a standard, boring, normal automatic, and so this car has a shiftable automatic transmission, which by modern standards is normal. All cars have that, but back in the early to mid 90s, it was a huge deal. The way it worked was you put it in drive, and then you flipped this little switch next to the gear lever into S, which stood for sport, and then you could shift the gears yourself. And you did that on the steering wheel. You have little arrows on each side of the steering wheel. The right is up and the left is down, and that's where you would shift your gears. Now, you didn't exactly press on the arrows themselves. Instead, you had a little button behind the steering wheel rim you could push on. On the right side, you push the upshift button, and on the left side, you push the downshift button, and that's how you shifted gears, even though you had an automatic. Alpina called this the Switchtronic system, and they were very proud of it, as they well should have been, because it was unusual at the time. But they were so proud that they put in the very center of the steering wheel, Alpina with their logo, and then Switchtronic directly underneath. It was that big of a deal that it was placed directly in the center of the steering wheel, and that was the situation with the transmission in this car. Now, other things worth noting with the steering wheel are colors, which are very interesting. Blue and green are Alpina's colors, and they integrate them into a lot of their cars in various places. And here you see it on the steering wheel. In the center, going around the wheel rim, is stitched blue and green. Looks very cool. And on the inside of the wheel rim, you have blue stitching on the upper half, and then green stitching on the lower half, which is also cool. But my very favorite stitching detail on the steering wheel is the arrows for the Switchtronic system. You can see the arrow itself is green, and then the circle around the arrow is blue. And that's true on both sides. Your green and blue stitching even integrated into those arrows. You will also find green and blue stitching on the gear lever itself. You can see green stitching on one side, blue on the other. Again, this was sort of Alpina's thing. It was their colors, and so they added it in somewhat subtly. You will also find Alpina's colors on the seats. Look at the seats. You can see very 90s patterned cloth, like you might expect from a car like this. But in the very center, a little stripe of blue and green going down the seat back and also the seat bottom next to all that patterned cloth. You will find the very same thing on the door panels, where you have the same patterned cloth, but also the same blue-green Alpina-specific stripe complementing it. And there's quite a bit of other cool stuff in here worth pointing out. For one, the floor mats. You can see Alpina-specific floor mats. They are original to this car, with Alpina written across them many times diagonally. Again, a very 90s look for the floor mats, just like for the seats. You also have a plaque over on the passenger side of the dashboard signifying that this is a real Alpina and giving the production number in the B3 build order where this car fell. So you do have that cool Alpina plaque in here. Also, another change for the Alpina models compared to regular BMWs is the wood trim. You can see it here in the center, and apparently this is Alpina-specific wood. You could get wood trim in a regular E36 3 Series, but it was a different type of wood. This type, which is Burl Elm, was only used by Alpina, not by BMW, and so that is a distinction compared to a standard 3 Series, this distinctive Alpina wood. One other rather interesting distinction in here is the gauge cluster. You can see sort of a normal BMW 3 Series gauge cluster, but then a little closer to you, there's auxiliary gauges in here. Four little gauges on a screen readout, two over on the left for oil pressure and oil temperature, and two over on the right. One is for differential temperature, the other is the gear that you're currently in, because if you're shifting with the automatic, you might want to know exactly what gear you're in, and it's displayed there. There. This is Alpina specific. BMW models didn't have this extra gauge cluster, but Alpina added it in and they added in sensors to measure all this stuff. And then they just stuck it in front of the regular gauge cluster rather than designing a completely new one with this information. So you have a gauge cluster and then sort of a secondary one a little closer to you. But anyway, aside from those changes, which are relatively comprehensive in this interior, it's largely an E36 BMW 3 Series in here, which is of course what this car started life as. And that means you have the center control stack that's heavily tilted towards the driver, which was a characteristic touch of the E36. At the top of all that, you have that vent that's weirdly shaped and a little bit too large, also pointed in the direction of the driver. And at the base of that center control stack, you have this sort of information display that you can use to show various vehicle information whenever you tap certain
certain buttons that display stuff, kind of a precursor to a modern infotainment system, the very early stages of it you can see here, and this was a feature that a lot of the E36 3 Series models had. And next up, moving on to the back seat of the B3 Touring, you get back here and you notice, well, three interesting things. Number one, <laughs> there's not a lot of space back here. Now, the current 3 Series is not exactly a huge vehicle, but especially back in the 90s, it was pretty small. It was the entry-level BMW. If you wanted to transport adults around, you got a 5 Series or a 7 Series. This wasn't really for that, and so my knees are right up against the front seat, my head is up against the ceiling. It's a pretty small passenger compartment back here. Now, the next thing you notice when you're in the back is you have some of the same Alpina touches as you do up front. For example, the cool Alpina floor mats with Alpina, 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 written all diagonally across them, kind of a cool touch, and the same pattern cloth in the seats with the blue and green stripe going down the center, and same deal on the door panels in the back, the pattern cloth with the blue and green stripe, so some cool Alpina touches back here. But other than that, once again, you will also notice that it's basically an E36 3 Series back here. Nothing too unusual or special or interesting once you get past those little Alpina touches in back. Just pretty standard 3 Series rear seats. And finally, we move on to the cargo area in the B3 Touring, which is very interesting. I say that because, like I mentioned, the E36 3 Series Touring, the wagon version, was never sold here in North America, so I've never really been in the cargo area of a 3 Series wagon from this era. I've seen a few of these in Europe, but they're really, really rare in the States, and this one is here. So let's talk through cargo area. Now to get back here, you push on this little button with a keyhole, and then you just kind of lift, and it opens up the tailgate, and then you have the cargo area, the mysterious, never before seen in America. Well, there's really not all that much to it, actually. It just looks like a fairly standard cargo area with a cargo cover, nothing particularly unusual, but it does add some neat practicality to this car. BMW never made an M3 Touring model, so this is as close as you're gonna get with extra performance in the station wagon body style. It's like the ultimate enthusiast version of the E36, and you have the practical wagon component in back where you can throw stuff when you're doing high speed runs in your Alpina 3 Series wagon. And so, those are the quirks and features of the 1996 Alpina B3 Touring. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the Alpina B3 Touring. I have never before driven an automatic E36. This is a pretty good place to start because it's the best of the best with more power and a bigger engine than a standard E36. So let's see how it goes. All right, first thing I noticed driving this car, it feels a lot like an E36, as you might expect, which is, which is, <laughs> which is a good thing, to be totally honest. I love the E36. It was a well-sized car, little enough that you could kind of have fun with it and drive it pretty easily. And everything was just pretty nice in this interior. You had buttons that felt legit when you pushed them. The turn signal stock feels legit. Like, I like how that all feels when you drive around in this car. It really does have like a nice sort of solid feel Feeling to it. And this particular car has clearly been maintained pretty well. It's got 165,000 kilometers, which I guess is probably like 80, 90,000 miles, but it feels like less than that. It's a really nicely kept car that feels very solid on the road. Now, part of that is also probably some of the upgrades that Alpina made to it. I mentioned the suspension earlier. That was intended to give it sort of a more solid kind of road going feel. And this car has that. It's a good cruiser car. I'm going reasonably quick and it's very smooth and very kind of planted and solid. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't realize about Alpina. People think, oh, it's a BMW tuner, a BMW modifier. So they went for like big power and big excitement and acceleration. That's not really the goal. They do add more power, but their goal is sort of like these grand touring cars, more power for faster, long speeds, but also like, you know, an automatic transmission and kind of added comfort. And that's still true of Alpina models to this day. You know, when Alpina did the Z8, they added an automatic transmission to the Z8. All other non-Alpina Z8 models were manuals and that one was automatic automatic only, and that sort of was the Alpina ethos. So driving this car, beyond sort of the solid feel of it, let's try the manual shifting. So I'm in fourth, I downshift, yeah, <laughs> it works. I read an article about this car, the owner had one, and he, it was from a British magazine in period, and he sent it to me, and 
The magazine talks about how great the shifting is. What an amazing feature. This is the future. And I guess that was technically true. Paddle shifters have become the future. Shiftable automatic transmissions were are now commonly accepted. But it's amazing to think that like this torque converter automatic was ever considered. I mean, these people fawned over it. This is the greatest thing in the world. Feels like a Formula One car. And I'm sitting here like pushing the buttons like, yeah, I'm not... I don't know about that, but it is kind of nice to be able to shift. And it does add a little bit of an element of, you know, fun kind of do-it-yourself shifting that a you lose from not having a manual transmission. So let's talk about the two other big components of the driving experience of this car that are obviously worth pointing out. One is acceleration. And I have to say, it's pretty quick. You floor it and it moves. It has really strong acceleration and, and it's smooth. 265 horsepower is not an enormous amount, but in a car this size, it was a pretty significant significant number, especially back then, and it feels good and it feels nice and smooth and great to accelerate. Now again, this was more power than the M3 at the time, at least in the States, so it's a pretty good number. That was one of the things. The E36 to me, aside from the Euro model M3s, always had kind of a dainty little feel to it. Uh, even the M3 here in the States, it was fun to toss around and throw around, but it never had like some real muscle, and this car feels more like that than other E36 models. Now, as far as steering and handling goes, that's a strong suit of just about any E36. 36. It was something they all did really well. They all felt planted and, and sporty and fun to throw around. And it was a really great benefit of all the E36s. But I think it's especially true in this car. This car feels really solid when you're going straight and, and going fast, like I mentioned before. But it also has great steering feel, good heavy steering, great feedback. And it's just not that big of a car. And it gives you a really enjoyable experience. Going around corners feels nice and predictable. And yet at the same time, like reasonably tossable and exciting. And it just, it's nimble. It feels nimble and zippy and quick. And that's a cool, cool benefit of the E36 in general. And it sticks around even on this version. And then I will say one interesting comparison I can make to this car is my Audi RS2, which was kind of the other high performance wagon at the time. You know, this was sort of a segment that was just starting. BMW didn't even go into the segment with themselves. Only Alpina did it. BMW never made an M3 wagon. And so this car and the RS2 were sort of in a similar space in terms of positioning and also time. They were about out at the same era and this car just out handles the RS2. The RS2 is much faster. It's got about 60 more horsepower, 50, 60 more horses, and it just feels faster. Uh, and obviously the manual transmission adds some fun to the RS2. But the benefit of this car is that it really does feel tighter. The handling is better. Overall, there really is a lot to like here, a lot to like with this car. It's just cool. E36 Touring is just generally really cool. And this is sort of like the ultimate version of the E36 Touring with extra power and all these cool Alpina changes. And there's only 89 of these in the world, so you'll never encounter another one. I think there's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot to like here. If you're a wagon fan like I am, especially 90s cool sport wagons, this was one of the ultimate ones, and it's cool to be able to check it out and see not only E36 Touring, but like a cool, fun, exciting, rare, sporty version. And so that's the Alpina B3 Touring. This is a special car, a very unusual and very cool 90s sporty wagon, and you you're unlikely to find another one of these at your local Cars and Coffee, but you can find this one on Cars and Bids. Anyway, now it's time to give the B3 Touring a Doug score. And the Doug score is here, 53 out of 100, which places the Alpina B3 Touring here against some relevant cars. The B3 Touring is really cool, attractive, surprisingly fast, pretty nice riding, and most importantly, it's just rare and special. It's not as fast as my Audi RS2 or a Delta Integrale, but it's practical, fun, and rare, and it's definitely one of the coolest 90s wagons in existence.